Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike like Clayton here from XY Advisor. Today, uh, we're really lucky to have Phil Anderson here from the AFA. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Clayton. Good to be here. Mate, um, literally, as we saw each other, the quote was, hell or high water, this was happening because it is pouring out there and it's crazy. But um, you just got back from your roadshow and I know that the AFA um, released some, uh, some y- y- your opinions um, to the government, I think that w- the submission would have been by 28th Feb. Is that correct? Yeah, they were all due uh, the end of last week. So yep. we put three in last week and it was a very busy roadshow because we're not only were we presenting every day, but I was going back to my room and working on the submissions afterwards. So it's fantastic to get through to Friday and get them all in. <laughs> Mate, that's sensational. And then you've uh, just sent them out to your members yesterday. I'm sure the media will probably pick it up today. Uh, so the great to go through a couple of those because, um, you know, the AFA sits in a position where uh, you guys, I guess, are slightly smaller than the FPA, but you punch out a lot of, um, a lot of opinion, a lot of uh, sort of, um, you know, a lot of the supporting work. And most of that comes through you, right? You're kind of like head of that division. We're not a big team and and ultimately, yes, a lot of the drafting comes back to me, but I've I've got access to other people and and our our board and our executive committee um, play a very close interest in in the advocacy strategy and and what issues we uh, we pursue. Yep. Um, But yes, there's a a lot of work that needs to get done and, and it comes back to what we see as our role and advocacy is really important for the AFA, particularly at the moment when there's so many challenges in front of the advisor community. So um, trying to get the right outcome for advisors, but also for consumers of advice so that uh, we can ensure that um, more Australians get access to great advice. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, ha- having the privilege of sort of interviewing as many people as I have at this stage is uh, a lot of people, and, and I want to see where you sit on this, a lot of people are really happy with uh, change. It's just, you know, and, and change for the better. It's just the, the, the rapid um, the rapid change is probably, that's probably the best term for it. It's we're getting so many changes, changing so many things that that it's almost like the difference between stretching and then stretching to break. Um, Do do your thoughts reflect that at all? Yeah, I I think that's absolutely what we're facing. People are are welcoming change, but it's it's the pace of change. And people prefer to deal with a limited number of things at one time so that they can concentrate on them and they can uh, and, and they can get them right. They can build the right solutions and implement those solutions and then move on to the next thing. Where you're dealing with multiple changes and, and high levels of uncertainty at the one time, it becomes increasingly difficult. And that impacts um, how people feel and how effective they are in, in everything that they do. Yeah, yeah. It's um, because at the end of the day, uh, everything an advisor touches isn't going away so for example there's people that still need a lot of help they still exist there's still a lot of funds under management that needs to be invested still uh, a lot of people that need to be insured um and the list goes on and yet the the bau stuff is almost crowded out not in all occasions you know there are times i talk to advisors and they say for example, I was actually talking to my old boss. The first boss I had in uh, in financial services is when I was doing an accounting degree and uh, and I was working as a tax accountant for him, but he was also a financial planner. And he back in 2000 and when was I working for him? Maybe 2007, 2008. Even at that stage, because the, a lot of the financial planning clients were tax clients and the tax clients would come in every year. And so you would just... He, he'd been doing annual opt-in. I was speaking to him the other day since, you know, 2008 or something like that. Um, and so occasionally you find people that aren't in thrown, completely thrown under the bus. 
but the overwhelming majority of people are not that and uh and it's kind of it's kind of weird because uh, there's not a lot of jobs out there where what you're meant to be doing as a job and there's a lot to do as a financial planner like an exceptionally large amount of things and yet all of that has had to be parked as we've kind of gone through this i'd say last sort of two years it's been crazy it's it's uh it's it it's hard for me to fathom because i sold my business about three four years ago now and so i kind of missed the the crescendo but what are you seeing in terms of what what percentage of advisors do you think are being uh, thrown thrown around by this sort of change? I think pretty much everyone is being impacted to some extent, and um, some they're just welcoming the change and getting on with it and um, and refining what they do. But others, the change is more substantial and it is more fundamental and challenging their very existence. Uh, but you know we're, we're living we're, we're working with people across that spectrum and what our goal is is to get as many of the existing advisors uh, comfortable and confident to move forward into the new world and being part of, of that future we want to preserve what we have uh, as a very valuable service to the community which there is a huge level of demand for and that's the one uh, one thing that I've picked up in the in the roadshow in talking to um, so many people over the course of the last two weeks, they're all telling me how busy they are in terms of clients wanting advice. And and I guess one of the things that we need to ensure as an outcome of all of this is that the ultimate business model maximises the amount of time advisors can see in, in front of clients face-to-face and does not overstate or, or lead to a, a substantial increase in how much time they spend in the back office um, completing administrative processes. So we got to make sure that they can see as many clients as possible and deliver as much valuable advice as possible. Um, and that means we've got to have as efficient processes as possible. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I was, I was speaking with Sean Green the other day um, just here and he was saying how, you know, the back office uh, time to create advice has doubled um, it's sort of well known that you know even the price to open your doors on a on an annual basis, your fixed costs have, have blown out sort of ten times in the last ten years. Um, there's there's an there's a lot of things stacked against advice as a whole. But uh, one of the things we were talking about before we started was that your key message uh, during the roadshow was uh, there's hope. Um, I'd like to explore that a little bit more. Uh, what do you see as the first green shoots of hope? Well, I think the first one is the one we've already talked about, which is clients still are, are demanding advice. So as long as they are still demanding advice, um, then there's a, a very solid future for financial advice. But then it comes back to well, what are we actually seeing? And I'd say it's, it's early days. Um, but what we're doing is, is we're, we're optimistic that we're going to get the extension to the exam deadline and the um, education deadline. So that's playing its way through politics at the moment or through the parliament. But secondly, we're already seeing a lot of people having completed the exam. And what I think is really important is people start to tick things off. You know, if you've got a list of things that you've got to do, you've got to do the exam, you've got to do the, the education standard, you've got to... Um, transition your clients out of uh, grandfathered commission products. You've got to get your clients onto annual renewal arrangements. Um, and there's all this other stuff like the changes to income protection and agreed value and so yeah. on. If you can start to tick off that we're starting to make progress with all of these things, then it gives you confidence about the future. So we've already seen um, over 5,000 advisors who have sat the exam and 4,600-odd have already passed it. So I'm seeing around 20% of, um, of the current advisor population have passed the exam. So big tick for them. We're also hearing a lot of people have enrolled to do further study and um, and I know that Kaplan in particular is getting uh, a lot of students enroll in their subjects. So people are engaging in doing further study uh, and I have no doubt that they are um, already starting to make good progress. We've, we've also got, I think, an increasing recognition in the federal parliament that 
the government needs to be very considered and careful about reforms to financial advice so that we don't end up in a situation where financial advice is only available to the, the high, high net wealth individuals. We want to make sure that the reforms do not remove access to financial advice and affordability for financial advice for everyday Australians. And I think we're hearing some things that uh, suggest that that's more, more broadly understood. And I think we're starting to see businesses um, progress with this transition to the new model. There's a lot of businesses already moving to annual renewal. There's businesses that are coming to terms with which clients might be part of the future and which clients mightn't. And even for those clients who currently aren't, the work they're doing to get them to a uh, a model or an outcome where they are sustainable going forward, I think we're starting to see um, progress being made there as well. So I don't want to overstate the, the green shoots because there's a lot of people who are um, deeply anxious about the future and there's a lot of people questioning um, whether they want to be part of, of this profession going forward. Um, and it's going to be a difficult few years as we work through this, but, but I hope that we do um, hold on to as many of those good financial advisors out there who have been delivering quality service to their clients for many years um, to make sure that they're part of the future. Yeah, hands down. Um, the, the idea that, because if you think about any, any job that you're doing and then things are drastically changing, like in terms of costs, revenue models, um, standards, expectations, I mean, sort of every single part of an advisor has, over the last couple of years has just been torn at, you know, and it is really crazy. And um, I always like to think about it in terms of imagine if this was happening to the medical profession, right? Um, I know that the, any kind of work in the medical profession is uh, stamped out, like any changes to, they just stamp it out immediately because, I guess you know that they're sort of a bit more unified and work for the government and that. But uh, there's just no chance that other professions would be able to deal with this insane, insane amount of change. And uh, I take my hat off to all the advisors that sort of decide to put their heads down and, um, you know, continue doing the good work. I, obviously, I know a fair few advisors. Just yesterday, I got a text message and... Um, and he is a part of a licensee that uh, is demanding, uh, you know, backdating of, you know, they want to review SOAs from uh, before he was even uh, in the business, right? So, we're, we're talking, you know, like a long time. And, um, and he sends me a text message yesterday and it was from the partner of a client who just passed. And the partner was saying the support and how you helped my partner over the last few months, so last months, has been nothing short of amazing and you've done so much for her and for her family and thank you. That's the stuff that never came out in the Royal Commission, right? The the, the good work that gets done um, is always sort of overshadowed by uh, someone made money here. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, like revenue is going to be earned in, in, in any business model, in any professional service. Um, you, you who are judging it may not, um, like how it's done. And yet, uh, that's the terms of agreement that the whole profession has lived on for so long. And now, uh, it's all changing. And then a lot of advisors have to really just every single piece of the puzzle which is really difficult to do BAU. Like it's really difficult to get a text message like that from a client. And yet to get a text message like that from a client during insane change and insane uh, compliance expectations, I mean, it just goes to show, I guess, the type of person that advisors are. And I take my hat off to them. Yeah, I, I think that um, they are delivering great outcomes for their clients and they're going to keep doing that. Um, and what is not understood, what is clearly not understood, and, and, and um, Hayne, um had no idea of the value of financial advice. I mean, he, he um, from the statements that I've read, particularly when he's talking about the value of advice to super fund members, he seems to have assumed that it's all about the product. 
and you know our message throughout the Royal Commission process was to talk about the value of financial advice. And I, I just don't think he listened to anything that we were saying. And you're right, he never, he never spoke um, to good advisors. He, he barely spoke to advisors at all. But he never spoke to people who who could explain exactly what good financial advice was and what the value of it was. So we find ourselves in a situation where we have a very valuable product, but the perception is very different, and it's the clients of financial advisors, the existing clients, who think they're doing a great job in, yeah. in large part. And and I absolutely empathise with your point about those look-back projects. Uh, you introduced the comparison of, of the medical profession you can just imagine how the medical profession would feel if um, if they started to look at their prescription recommendations in 2008 uh, and assessed whether that was appropriate in the context of uh, the research on that medication that came out in 2015. You know, it's that sort of scenario that we're dealing with here that you're being judged on today's standards for what you did so long ago and the other part about it is so much time is being spent looking back yeah. when that's the least value that you can provide to your clients. And in fact, you know, most of these clients uh, where these issues are arising are very happy with the services that they have received. And if for whatever circumstances they may have missed a review in um, at one stage or twice over the last 12 years, I don't think they're the ones banging down the door saying, you've got to fix this. Yeah. I was speaking with some advisors the other day and they were saying they do a lot of their communications through WhatsApp, which I thought was quite interesting. I've never used WhatsApp to that extent, to the to the extent that you can upload documents. You know, I, I chat to my mom on there, right? So, but, uh, but he, he, he was saying uh, he handles all communications via WhatsApp and then it got me thinking, like what constitutes an annual review if you if you're having constant communication, you know? Like how is is it on on WhatsApp would you say uh do you accept, you know, in text message, do you accept this to be an annual review and the person says yes? Like it, I know this is a this is a bit of a uh, a fire out there question, but not really. You... It's actually a question that we we've, we've dealt with in our submission. Oh, right. So one of the things that I emphasised was um, when um, Bill Shorten was the minister and he was um, responsible for, for um, getting the, the FOFA legislation through, some of the things that were said um, was that it would be okay to opt in via a text message. Now, at the moment, the legislation is suggesting you need written consent. So one of the things that we've asked the question of, what is written consent uh, and what might it look like for a client who's in their caravan in the Kimberley and they've got 30 days to respond. Um, they don't have their scanner with them, so they can't scan. They can't print the document. They can't scan it. Yeah. Um, you know, what? what is the solution that actually works in the best interests of clients? We don't want financial advice to be something that constrains when they can go on holiday and when they can't. Um, it has to be user-friendly and it has to be efficient. So I, I think this is a really good question. I, you know, WhatsApp is a tool that I have every expectation. I, I do use it from time to time. Yeah. In fact, it's a very useful tool for communicating within the family. Yes. But uh, I don't know that it existed in 2012 when they were looking at, at opt-in and, uh, and fee disclosure statements. So... Uh, the the technology we need to keep um, time with the technology and where that can be the solution uh, we need to we need to make sure that that's the case but it comes back to if the licensee requires proof and ASIC requires proof then how do we get um, backups of of WhatsApp and load that onto X plan and and so on so. I'm no expert on this, but these are the things that we've got to challenge in the in the short term. That's awesome that someone's approaching this because it would it would seem absurd. And every advisor knows, you know, you're like, sure, you 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 organise an annual review, right? But the chances that you're going to be conversing with that client in between now and the annual review, it's it's this yeah, it's just so much 
uh, so much that's not taken into account for. I mean, the concept that you catch up with a, a client, you know, let's say 11 months out of 12 months, right? For whatever reason, maybe it, it, WhatsApp, but they don't turn up on that, you know, within that 30 day period and they don't respond to that. Imagine the lunacy it would be to say, actually, uh, you, I can't keep you on as a client because you didn't turn up on this particular 30 day period. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, literally this happening already. Um, clients being forced to turn off, uh, fees for clients and, and keep them on as ongoing clients. Looking at emails of them saying, why are you, for lack of a better term, why are you dumping me? You know, what, what, like, why are you getting rid of me? Um, and yet, the advisor is forced to under the, the current compliance regime, which is, you know, it's um, it's clearly not tenable for the long term. It's just, it's not even an option. Um, what do you think about, uh, so, you know, speaking of changes, the, the 28th of uh, February was the submission date for uh, the Treasurer's, you know, last round of changes. What do you think about this restriction of fees from my super? Uh Absolutely, um, really important issue. But let me just also make one point uh, about what you said before. And I don't want to dramatize coronavirus, right? But but let's, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep my coughs to a minimum. But let's let's imagine how this progresses. And what if um, you know, clients are reluctant to come into the city to meet with their advisor to sign? their renewal notice oh that's a really good point that's definitely going to happen someone to somewhere yeah for sure so what flexibility is there in the system um to allow for that and that's what we're demanding we want flexibility in the system in, in the renewal system so that clients can sign any anywhere between the ninth month and the 15th month whether it's um being on on holidays, whether it's being unwell, whether it's being distracted by other issues in life. Busy with work and family. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, for older clients, it might be looking after grandchildren. It might be the fact that they just can't make it into that meeting that, that, um, Normal that they've life. scheduled. Yeah. And then, and then all of a sudden, um, it, it's a fundamental problem and the arrangement gets cancelled and, and it's to their detriment as yes. a result. So. Um, trying to shove everything into that 30-day window. We're, our argument is this does not work in the best interests of clients yeah. uh, and therefore that's something that fundamentally needs to be changed. And whilst the government is looking at the whole opt-in FDS process, let's use this as an opportunity to get a much more um, streamlined, efficient, cost-effective process that actually meets the needs of clients. Um, coming back to my super. It's interesting to, to look at that recommendation because that recommendation was basically saying that uh, Hain did not see any value in financial advice to my super clients. It comes back to what I said before is he all obviously thought of advice as specific to the product mm. and did not appreciate that advice is strategic. It's about more than just the product. Yeah. And uh, whilst we're constrained by the sole purpose test when it comes to super and you've got to make sure that the advice complies in terms of the scope that's permitted by the sole purpose test, but quite clearly advice on consolidation of super complies with the sole purpose test, advice on salary sacrificing into super complies with the sole purpose test. Advice in preparation for retirement three years, five years down the track complies with the sole purpose test. Advice on your insurance arrangements. That's right, yeah. Um, advice on death benefit nominations. I mean, how many people actually understand the tax consequences um, in, in the case where their the beneficiaries might be adult children? They don't understand. And so it, it's so important that people get advice. And here he is saying, I don't think there's any value in, uh, in, in financial advice for my super members. We totally disagree with that. Now, we don't think this is a, a huge issue for, for advisors at the moment. I don't think a lot of them are generating a lot of, um, advice fees from clients in my super accounts. Sure. Yep. But it's not about 
that. It's yeah. about the future and the rights of these people to be able to get advice that's paid for from their fund. And why that's important is because not everyone is on a high income and can afford to pay for financial advice out of their cash flow. Totally. Some people are focusing on getting their mortgage under control and just living day to day with, with all the, the family expenses they need to face. So let's not force them to pay for it out of their bank account if they can access it, uh, the fees from, from their, their super account. And also, why disadvantage them in terms of being able to access to the tax benefit of being able to pay it out of uh, a super fund and accessing the 15% um, tax benefit that they get from there. So there's all these arguments for, for why this is a recommendation that is fundamentally not going to work in the best interest of clients. And, and it's one that whilst we're not optimistic that the government's going to make changes, it's one that I think stands out as such an obviously flawed recommendation that the parliament needs to have a good look at this one and work out whether this is actually the right outcome. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. In my anecdotal experience, I would definitely say there's probably not a lot of advice fees being received from my super, um, but it is so obviously a bad decision. Even from um, a fundamental look at behavior, it, as an advisor, if a client comes in to my office, right? So, the whole point of VOFA was to stop sort of playing around with super consolidations and rollovers and things like that and um, you know, to, to avoid any sort of motivating factor of moving in or out anywhere. And yet, they're reintroducing this so clearly by, by if, if, as an advisor, if the client comes in, they, they want retirement advice, they've got a my super product, and they can't pay from cash flow. It's like, all right, well, you've given no option here except to move to a product that can pay an advice fee. The the obviousness of that scenario blows my mind that it was ever even suggested. And and it opens up, I guess, a bigger point, which is why on earth is advice the whipping boy of parliament right now? Like what's going on? Why is it just under constant – going back to the medical profession, if me and you sat down and we went, actually – we're here to sort out the medical profession. This is what we're going to do with pharmacy. This is what we're going to do with surgery. You know, if, if, if the two of us, you know, you're probably more intelligent than I, but I feel like we still might not be able to solve all the problems because we're not experts in the field. The fact that politicians are, are coming in and constantly, it seems constant, just constantly going after advice, not giving it a chance to breathe. I don't think the constituents out there are demanding the death of financial planning. I just, I, I see it as this real weird non sequitur to this, this whole sort of desire for, like, you know, getting votes. Like, why are they, why are they going after financial advice? Well, I think that's an invitation to talk about a thesis on how the political process works, but um, it's a, it's a, Difficult answer. Uh, it's something that has been building for quite some period of time. Obviously, the the GFC and the, and the product failures out of the GFC was a really big trigger. Um, storm, uh, all of those matters that we've just seen this uh, this um, constant focus on on financial advice as seem to be the problem. But we've also, as you rightly point out, we've got people who don't understand making recommendations that seem to have, have sway. Now, uh, as, um, as I think uh, the, the PJC, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, heard in, in the hearings in uh, 19th of, of November, um, Haynes suggested that intrafund advice was not personal advice. He's wrong. <laughs> Intrafund advice is absolutely personal advice. The best interest duty applies. All these other obligations apply to intrafund advice. But he didn't understand that. Now, here we've got a situation where we've got one person making a recommendation, um, and it's, it's him making the, the recommendation, 
and the the ALP agreed to implement all of his recommendations before they were released, and the government got them on a Friday and had released their their uh, extensive response of all of their actions on the Monday. So all the decisions were made over the course of, of a weekend. Um, and, and here we are now more than a year on, and the government's progressing with the implementation of, of these things. The other thing that, that we talk about in our submission is there is no regulation impact statement. On, on any of this stuff that's been released. So what are the consequences of putting in annual renewal, the way it's been proposed? What consideration was given to the options? If you go back and have a look at um, when good legislation was developed, there was always a regulation impact statement that talked to the options that were considered and the implications or the cost of, of implementing what was proposed. So unfortunately, we have an environment now where 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 the process is running um, with a head of momentum to deliver outcomes, but we can we don't have the confidence that those outcomes will necessarily deliver better results for clients. Um, and of course, uh, the background of of all of this is when it's easy for the media to run stories, the mainstream media to run stories about bad advice. Um, uh, and there, there have been obviously examples of that over, over the last 10 years. There's a, a lack of inclination to run stories about good financial advice. So we've, we've just had this momentum that's built, um, ended in a Royal Commission, and now it's about implementing those Royal Commission recommendations and the ability to get better outcomes is constrained when you've got this political momentum behind the perceived necessity of implementing things that, that came through a Royal Commission. That's the environment we live in. Yeah, right. I, I really liked um, FOFA. I thought I was a big fan of FOFA um, in terms of removing uh, new commissions for investment and superannuation products, allowing grandfathered uh, and not touching insurance commissions. I thought that was like a really good initial step that achieved a huge solution. Like it, it, it solved the storm problem in a lot of ways. Like it, you know, like we can say that the FOFA was a result of the storm and uh, it solved that from happening again. Not perfectly, but certainly to the extent that storm occurred like you, you, you basically solve those problems oh yeah i i interestingly i spent a month in my career at a practice that was essentially a mini storm and i i couldn't even believe that it was even happening at that stage i was just power planning it and i'm looking at this thing going ah, all the projections go down <laughs> i don't know about this and uh and so i was a fan of fofa you know when it came in what sort of happened since then has been, it's been a little bit rabid. It's been a little, uh, I guess, over, overwhelming. Um, and I'm not convinced that these recommendations are actually going to achieve what they're attempting to achieve. And when I say what they're attempting to achieve, I don't even really know what they're trying to achieve. Like, I can't figure out legitimately i can't figure out if they're saying well we're okay if there's only a hundred advisors and people with 10 million dollars plus get advice for five years between 63 and uh, 68 like i can't figure out if that's actually what they're trying to do because they obviously haven't come out and said that but then all of the things that are sort of cascading down out of the royal commission lead me to believe that whether that was a conscious decision or an unconscious decision, it's kind of headed in that direction. And so um, and so because that's because that fundamental premise is uh, wrong in that advice is only valuable for those small select amount of people, um, then how do we respond? like how 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 should advisors respond to, and it's a tricky thing because obviously, you know, people being people, you can, everyone complains about everything all the time. So 
it doesn't but the fact that you know things have been potentially complained about previously that didn't have such a big impact doesn't take away from the fact that what's what's happening now is of i think overwhelming concern and if everything goes through then we may end up in a situation where just so few planners can afford to give advice to so few clients and so Phil, what do you think we should do to stop that from happening? Well, I could give you one suggestion, um, but let me just take you back. One of the things we talked about in our My Super submission was the different regimes. So you've got the general advice regime, the intra-fund advice regime, the personal advice to retail clients regime, and then you've got the wholesale advice regime. Now, Of all of these reforms that have impacted financial advice uh, since FOFA, wholesale advice has been left unchanged. There is no best interest duty. We already knew there were limited disclosure obligations. Um, LIC commissions up the wazoo. uh, (laughs) Another issue. Um, There's no opt-in. There's no FDS. Crazy. So, so we've got this fundamental lack of uh, level playing field where all of the focus of the regulatory reform is on personal advice to retail clients. Now, for those clients um, who could who could argue that they were wholesale, well, there is a solution. They go down the wholesale um, pathway. But most licensees don't want to operate in the wholesale space because it's one where there's less controls uh, and there's potentially, although not directly or immediately, there's more um, regulatory risk, particularly if if there's an argument that the clients weren't wholesale and they should have been treated as as retail. Um, So that's just the backdrop to this issue, that the reform across uh, across the broader financial services sector in terms of advice has been very different and it delivers different outcomes. Your point is how do we ensure that we still have access to advice for everyday Australians? Yes. And and that's where you know, we we can look at the, the background around, around wholesale, but I don't think the solution is for advisors to go into wholesale. I think the solution is for us to fight for a much better outcome on on these reforms. Now, if I was to pick out one, I think annual renewal is probably the biggest challenge to being able to provide services in a cost-effective way to um, everyday Australian clients. And we know absolutely with all these other background factors, whether it's increase in licensee fees, PI insurance, um, compliance costs, uh, some of the pressure around the steps you need to follow to comply with the best interest duty that's come out of ASIC Report 515 for the large institutions, if that rolls out more broadly, then the costs go up. So all this pressure on cost. Um, so the average, so the, I guess the minimum um, economically viable fees per year is is going up and it will continue to go up. But with these reforms in front of us, we've got to make sure that we get much better outcomes. I think we've got to go back and say, well, what's the objective of this? And annual renewal is one where I say, well, what is the objective? Well, the objective is that the client has visibility of what they're paying and they have the opportunity to, to choose to continue that or discontinue it. That's the basic objective of this. And that, if you achieve that, then haven't we delivered what we're trying to do here? So you go then back and have a look, well, what does the client want? The client wants control. They want flexibility. They can give their agreement at a time that they choose. And then also they want this to be cost effective. They want to do this. If they've got to go through this process, then they want to do it in a way that doesn't significantly add to the cost of the services that they're paying for. I mean, that's counterintuitive for them to be forced to go through a process they don't want to go through and then they have to pay for that process. So that's why we're arguing that there needs to be a fundamental relook at this whole proposition. If a client is giving consent, give it once. Let's not get them to sign an agreement, an opt-in notice and a consent form for the product provider. Yeah. Let's just get them to sign one thing. Let's give them flexibility between the ninth month and the 15th month to sign it. 
And, and really importantly on that point, at the moment, there's a number of licensees out there um, who are saying that if you haven't delivered the review by the 12th month, then you have to refund fees. Yeah, it's crazy. And our view is you don't always have control of that. You might be doing your review at the 11th month mark and discover that some things have changed uh, in terms of the client circumstances that mean you need to refresh the advice. And you may not be able to complete the research and put the SOA together and present it to the client in time to meet that 12-month deadline. Let the advisor and the client undertake the review anywhere between, or at least between, uh, before the 15th month. If they do it at the 8th month, it doesn't matter. As long as they've done the review, but then they need to get the authorization to continue the arrangement anywhere between the ninth month and the 15th month. So if we can do that, if we can get greater flexibility, we can get um, a single document that's signed, um, we can move to a, a more sensible outcome on this, providing consent forms to product providers. At the moment, the draft legislation, particularly outside the soup space, places no obligations on those product providers. So if they get these forms... What are they supposed to do with them? There's there's no requirements about record keeping. There's there's no requirements in there that they have to turn the fees off. Why are we giving these forms to product providers? <laughs> and, and and if you if you really ask the question, well, if the processes are in place for the advisor to do the right thing and the licensee is checking that the advisor is doing the right thing, and maybe the product provider can do some sample checking to make sure that that the right thing is being done and that those consents exist. We just need to find a more sensible solution for this one because it will significantly drive up the cost. You look at it, for pre-FOFA clients on asset-based fee arrangements, right? you've got to put opt-in in place for the first time. If they're on an asset-based fee arrangement, then the advisor has an obligation to calculate what the fees of the next 12 months will be and to document the basis of that in the FDS. That's all adding to cost. You've then got to um, get the client to to sign the consent form, to to sign um, the opt-in notice. Um, They've got to provide those notices to to the product providers. At this stage, there's no technology solutions for this. And how do we make sure that we have a, a really efficient process that does not unnecessarily add to cost, which is only going to ultimately end up with clients paying more and some of the clients losing access to advice. So this is a really important one in in my view that we'll be looking for our members to um, talk with their local member of parliament to argue for a much more sensible outcome that comes back to those objectives Visibility of the fees being paid and the opportunity to select to continue or discontinue, but in a way that gives control to the client, flexibility to the client, and a cost-effective outcome. Absolutely. Um, the tricky thing with, I mean, a, a lot of this stuff, but I imagine, um, <laughs> I imagine if the the rule was that uh, the the client had to opt in to the asset based fee to the client and the asset based fee to the product <laughs> as well. I think you very quickly find that the laws uh, would not put such insane amounts of um, requirement onto the client because ultimately it is a requirement onto the client, which then the advisor has to. Uh, facilitate for them and it's almost like death by admin a lot of this stuff i i can't i can't imagine i remember once uh you know it was at university or something and we we just had to do so much paperwork and the lesson at the end of the paperwork i think it was a, a you know it was actually a pretty cool university i remember sort of midway through one of the um one of the classes i did we had to put forward an argument you know, an essay, and then at the end of the year, the end of the, the semester um, assignment was actually to prove yourself wrong. So, but we didn't know that was the, and that was a really good learning experience. But I remember another one was uh, we had to do a bunch of paperwork uh, and then track what the paperwork actually achieved. And it was, you know, I think it was a management uh, class, and they were just talking about how 
so much there's there's a lot of paperwork that achieves no you know actual outcome uh it seems like with advice again it it whether the intention is to to push everyone out of advice or not that's kind of what's going to happen i mean what on earth value benefit or anything does uh an additional document from the product provider get getting signed and then uh handing that to the client and then handing that to the product i mean i get it from say a trustee's point of view like i i if if the trustee is saying hey we just want to we're getting pressure to make sure that um you know only fees are being received live up to the expectation of the sole purpose test and all of our responsibilities and i get all that but guess what there's like a bunch of ways to do that um that don't involve the advisor at all um they can they can on assuming that the client involves themselves at all there would be some level of hey a, a, a pop-up box on their uh on their application or their um, online platform to access you know when when looking at their funds for example that's off that's the first thing off the top of my head um but it's just such an easy uh it's just such an easy i oh, will punt it to the advisor so if we punt it to the advisor the advisor will take care of it and it's just there's too too many of these things that are just getting punted to the advisor when they're trying to achieve something which I guess a lot of the times I can see why they're trying to achieve something, but just the ongoing solution for a lot of these things is, oh, the advisor will handle it. Handle it. Uh, it's just annoying. Now, um, you- although um, on that particular point, yes, um, the uh, the two key regulators, APRA and ASIC, put out a letter to Superfund trustees in April last year, uh, and in that they they raised a number of points. One of them was that they thought it was best practice for the trustees to get consent from the clients. So if the trustees go directly to the clients, it, it takes the advisor out of the loop. Yeah. But the problem with that is they're more than likely going to do it via mail. Mm. And then all of a sudden we end up with a situation where Clients don't open the mail. Totally. They don't know what to do. They don't respond. Any research on clients responding to mail campaigns suggests a very low response rate. Advisors then don't know whether clients have responded or not, and they have got no visibility of it. So it's it's creating a process that is totally out of the control of the advisor. So we have argued that the process needs to be controlled um, by the advisor but it needs to be streamlined and it needs to be meaningful. At the moment, yeah. if you have a look at, at opt-in notices, it, it, what's, the sign, what's the client actually signing? Thus signing for the continuation of an agreement. Um, where is that agreement? What is that agreement? Now, that, they're actually signing something that says I'm, <laughs> that I'm continuing something that I, I, maybe I know or maybe I don't understand. Let's have a much better outcome where the client is actually signing um, a, an agreement that actually sets out what services they will get and what they're paying for that. And then let's have a schedule to it that is for each product provider because product providers should not have visibility of the other um, accounts that clients hold. Yep. So we've got to manage the privacy considerations here. So how do we get an outcome where product providers only get what they really need, which is the client approving the fee to be taken out of their account and not um, anything else. That you know, if, if they ended up looking at statements of advice, then that would be a real privacy issue because product providers would all of a sudden know what other money the client had, what income they had, and, and you know, that's not the right outcome because they could potentially... Um, and I'm not implying they would, but they could potentially use that for commercial purposes. Yeah. Look, again, um, just even privacy, I think you mentioned that up front. It's more than enough of a reason why that just, that option seems insane, but it's kind of, yeah, it would solve all of the problems. So to me, 
I guess we all we go back to like, what is the government trying to achieve? Are they trying to achieve? And I wish I could just get an answer out of them on this simple question. Do you want there to be little advisors with little people getting advice? At least then I know why all these things are happening and and we can be a bit more forthright in saying, well, we disagree. But if they, if they say, no, 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 like we're not interested in decimating the industry and we're interested in keeping as many advisors around as possible, good advisors, you know, look at all the facier qualifications and expectations. So that argument I feel like should be out the window for at least the next 20 years, for God's sake, leave us alone. Um, so let's assume once everyone gets through there that, that we're not going to come knocking on our door again to, to ensure that all advisors are good. Let's just for a moment assume that they are. And so all these additional expectations, I just wonder how much value like, is, is, is it as simple as this, Bill? Is it a case of a lot of the products, the trustees got in trouble during the Royal Commission because they were doing, using their own bank accounts and not paying much interest? And, and so they've turned around and said, Oh, we better now do something to make the regulator happy. And then, Oh, of course, now it goes through the advisor. Is it something as simple as that? Cause if it is, I, we can at least sort of maybe go back to the root issue and work on, that no, that no part of the ecosystem is perfect and, you know, perhaps, you know, products should be looking at what they're doing themselves rather than putting this extemporaneous um, expectation on clients and advisors. Like, I don't know. I think one way of looking at this is is you look at the, the regulatory regime and then you look at, which I'm talking about the legislative regime, and then you look at the... Um, the compliance regime. And then you think about it in terms of a pendulum. And, and we would argue that the regulation that's in place to a large extent meets um, the, the requirements to ensure we have a, an efficient marketplace. But that, that's being swung way further into a, a much more rigorous regulatory regime. Then we've got the, the compliance regime um, pendulum, and that's also, uh, as a result, in large part of the Royal Commission, it's swung way to the, to the far end that it's, it, it's extreme. Um, and, all of, and both of these things are impacting the cost. Now, will we somehow um, see at some point in the short term the pendulum swing back into the middle, which is where it should be, where the balance is right, and the um, regulatory controls and compliance controls are in balance and they are cognizant of the cost of them so that it's in balance to ensure the clients get the right outcome. Now, at the moment, the pendulum is way in in terms of the, the spectrum of over-regulate and, and over-bureaucratize the compliance process. Um, we can argue... Uh, the, it, it needs to come back to the middle and we hope over time that's the outcome. But that's the battle we have in front of us. And you just hope as many advisors stick around for it to come back. Yeah, I know. Um, mate, thank you so much for coming in. If there's any advisors that want to reach out or uh, join the campaign to, you know, touch base with their local member and uh, sort of, you know, jump on board with uh, what it is the AFA is trying to achieve at the moment, um, how do they how do they get in contact? Well, the uh, they, they can contact us policy at afa dot asn dot au. Um, on our website, we have our advocacy pack. Uh, we've got our uh, our submissions. We'll be doing um, more simple, straightforward um, one pages, two pages to to use in advocacy. Uh, but please, please um, get in touch with us. Uh, we strongly encourage members to build relationships with their local members of parliament and, for that matter, senators from their state. Uh, the only way that we're going to get a sensible outcome is that uh, there's that pressure, there's, there's that recognition of the issues by um, politicians across the country that lead to more sensible, more pragmatic outcomes in both the party rooms, whether that's uh, um, the coalition or, or the ALP, and also in the parliament itself. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for the opportunity. Cheers. Cheers.